Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yichun. So I'm currently running the data and AI section for SP Group. But one question, how many of you know uh, SP Group? Oh, don't know. OK, so SP Group is the utility company in Singapore. So they're running the, uh, the, the bidding and uh, metering and ser the bidding services for the household and every single organization. And uh, we are managing the transmission and diffusion network for electricity and gas for Singapore. Good. So uh, give you a big context. So today I'm going to share one of our works uh, related to uh, anomaly detection from the IoT time series. Uh, this is the agenda. So I will start with the problem, the condition monitoring and anomaly detection. And uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with Auto Encoder, but I will still give a very brief introduction on that and how it is used for anomaly detection. Then I will go into our thinking about what, what is the challenge of directly applying the Auto Encoder and how we explore a new idea and how we designed it. And I also will talk a bit about the workflow because not just the algorithm, but the how to automate, how to build it as a service is also important for our goal. And I will end up with some uh, energy-related use case to demonstrate the performance and benefit of the methods. So let's start with the problem, the, the condition monitoring and anomaly detection. So um, you, you may know with the progress of the IoT, big data, and AI, so a lot of industry, a lot of company has started or will continue to deploy a lot more sensors to digitize uh, their devices, equipment, systems, as well as the business process. So this is in the, the area of the so-called uh, Industry 4.0. So this is also especially true for the energy and industry space. So for, for us, for SP Group, actually we have a lot of use case which we need a condition monitoring. So for example, we need to monitor or check the status of the every single meters in every house to make sure our metering and billing services is accurate. So for our district cooling business, we need to make sure the cooling tower and chiller is functional properly to provide the cooling supply, for example, right? So for the microgrid with new renewables, then we have new things like the solar panel, the energy storage system, need to functional properly to make sure we get the most economic dispatch to, provide, uh, to supply the energy. And in terms of core business, the, the transmission and distribution network, then you, you have a lot more uh, conditional monitoring use case. We need to monitor the transformer, a lot of equipment inside the network. Right? So providing a better mo condition monitoring will help our business to improve our operation and make sure our services is reliable. So that's the goal we want to achieve. And as one of the important steps for the condition monitoring is anomaly detection. So anomaly detection focuses on identifying the data points that do not conform the normal or expected behavior of the, the system or the, the process. So in general, there are three types of the anomaly detection methods. So the manual methods rely on the manual inspection uh, conducted by the human. But it requires a, a lot of human efforts so it cannot be scaled up to handle a large volume or large number of the data. And second, the, this kind of inspection, inspection work is tedious and boring. So the, the inspection uh, quality normally will decrease after the first initial period. So the staff may be very happy to do the inspection for the first, half, first month. But after that, I think it, it, it's not sustainable, right? And Second type of method is the rule-based. So in general, the, uh, uh, the rule-based work like uh, you will set up the minimum and maximum value for the measurement according to the OEM spec. So anything within the range is deemed as a normal. Anything outside of the range is deemed as abnormal. But the, the, the disadvantage of the rule-based method is first, these methods introduce a lot of false alarm. Second, this fixed setup it's not adapt to the different environment, different situation. So just imagine the same, same type of equipment of the same brand when they deploy into different environment and the working condition is different. So with time uh, evolve, right, the behavior of the equipment will be different. So some behavior in one situation is a normal behavior, but if you shift to another environment, the meaning is different, it, it's become abnormal. So the rule cannot capture these kind of things. So that's why 
the third category, data-driven methods, is preferred. So instead of relying on human inspection or loose, this kind of method will learn the common behavior of the equipment from the data and detect anything different from the uh, common behavior as a normally. But driving the adoption of these data-driven methods for anomaly detection is hard, actually. Because in a very, I mean, very often situation, if you ask the users, they will say, OK, I like this kind of method. I want the anomaly detection. But when you go into the detail, you ask, what are the, what are the anomaly you try to detect? Then they will tell you, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what kind of anomaly I'm looking for. Then what kind of business value you're attracting there? So our solution to this, actually, we want to provide a low-cost, easy-to-use, out-of-box solution to the users. We want them to explore as much as possible the use case as the first stage. Then they will give the feedback about some of the low value uh, use case. They can directly use the out-of-box solution. For some other uh, use case, if you need a very accurate, I mean, more advanced solutions, then you go into the customization mode. So today what I'm going to show is, is that our effort to try to make a, a low cost, easy to use out-of-box solution for anomaly detection. Uh, so autoencoder is one of the common methods uh, being used for anomaly detection. So I may want to ask the question, how many of you know the autoencoder? OK, so a so few of them. So uh, I will give a very quick in introduction. So autoencoder is the type of neural network with the encoder and, and decoder architecture. So uh, the idea of the autoencoder is it, kind of self-learning. So here the self-learning means that uh, the unlabeled data is used as the, the data itself is used as the label to train the network to learn how to reconstruct the, the signals. So the output of the ne network is targeted to be as similar as possible to the input data. So the idea behind the autoencoder, normally they will introduce an uh, information bottleneck uh, for the encoder part, means you want to learn a concise representation of the input data. And then the decoder will then how can I reconstruct the original signals from the concise representation to make it as similar as to the, the input data. There are a, a quite a lot of different variants of the standard autoencoder. So for example, the variational autoencoder will try to encode the input data to the parameter of the data distribution instead of the data itself. Because it will allow you to do the sampling out of this distribution to generate the new samples. And for time series, the LSTM autoencoder will replace the MLP with the LSTM to try to learn, automatic learn the feature which can better represent the time series. Right? So the, the method we are talking about later actually can, is independent about what kind of autoencoder you use. It generally can, you can apply different variants of the autoencoder. But for the talk, I will use the most standard MLP autoencoder. And this is the general the framework how to apply the autoencoder for anomaly detection. So during the training uh, phase, you are given a, a collection of a subsequent, subsequent windows. Uh, by encoding and decoding these subsequent windows, you get the reconstruction error. So the error will be back propagated through the network to update the network, allow it to learn to minimize the reconstruction error from the input to output. And then after the model is trained, for online detection, a new subsequence window will pass through the network, uh, encoded and decoded. Then you can compute the reconstruction, uh, reconstruct error from that. So if the new uh, input sub, uh, subsequence windows, the essential information is different from the training data, then your model cannot well reconstruct it. So you will get a high reconstruction error, and that's how the anomaly was detected. So now, I want to go to the, the core part about how, to, uh, how the new methods we call the autoencoder forest is designed. So I will go to the motivation. So the first thing I want to talk about is there's a key challenge if you want to directly apply the autoencoder. So this is one IoT time series example. I highlight two windows. One is the uh, common daily profile. Another one is actually an outlier. It's a special event. So. This is the common daily profile for this chiller, the cooling tower system. This is the special event. The, at that day, the cooling tower, uh, the fan is not turned on. But 
if you directly apply the autoencoder, you train a single autoencoder from the whole data set, uh, you can see actually the autoencoder can encode both of the profile quite well. This is not the, the expected result we want to see. We want to see it can differentiate. Right? So um, the reason is the autoencoder is kind of self-learning. So there's no easy way for it to do something like a cross-validation to see how good or how bad the trend model is. So it probably can encode everything. It can encode whatever the data it passed to you. It, can, it basically can encode everything. Then you cannot differentiate the, the normal thing and the normal things. But even you are given, let's say, another scenario, you are given a historical anomaly examples. It still faces these issues because the whole training data set has a lot of varieties. So if you train a single model on that, your, you, the model must be able to cover all the variety inside your data. So I will use a synthesized example to, to illustrate this. So suppose this is the data set you are given, and one project to 2D space is something like this. So you can see there are multiple structures inside your time series. So when you use a single autoencoder to model this, it basically you cover the whole space, cover every single structure. Then there's unnecessary, uh, you cannot avoid uh, some area outside of the data. So you unnecessarily involve the, the, the area, like for example, in the middle. This is the data, this is the area outside of the data. And where the unseen anomaly may appear in here in future. So, so the idea may be very simple, right? So instead of building the one or two, actual thinking is that how about I build multiple models, one focus on individual structure of the cluster. And by doing this, you now, you only try your best to, every single model will really focus on the specific pattern, the, the training data passes to it. And you will very, you will try to avoid as much as possible the unnecessary area you try to involve. So this is the, the motivation about the challenge and the, the, uh, the basic idea underlying the, the autoencoder forest. We try to do the problem. So if you uh, So let's continue. So the natural idea is like, how now the question is how do you identify the, the different cluster inside your data? Then you can train the individual autoencoder. So from the previous illustration, you may think the most intuitive way is that I apply the clustering on the data. Then for each detected cluster, I will try to learn uh, autoencoder from that. But it won't work. Actually, it will fail if you try the, the clustering on the subsequence. Because uh, the Eman and Jessica has studied this problem in their paper. So they found an interesting phenomenon about the clustering the subsequence. It's meaningless. They, their conclusion is that no matter what kind of the time series data is, if you apply the clustering on the subsequence, the, the detected cluster center will be something in, I show in the, in the right figure. It's something similar to the sine wave. So means if you apply the clustering on that, based on subsequence, the cluster you get, actually the variety of the data doesn't, didn't reduce. It still remained the same because it covered the whole spectrum of the, the, the sequence. So then the question is then, if we, the cluster, uh, clustering doesn't work, then what kind of information we can rely on to get the different group from the data? So what we try to explore is the time information, which is naturally available in any kind of time series. So this is an example. So given the time series, if you can be able to detect the repeating period from the, the time series. For example, let's say this is a time series. Uh, its pattern repeat every day. Then according to how many points you sample within a period, within a day, you can align all the sub-windows sampling at the same time. So for example, if it's a daily pattern, it's sample every hour, right? So 5 o'clock, 5 a.m. in the morning, if you collect all the, the, the subsequence window aligned on the 5 a.m. across the last three months, this is naturally a cluster because it shows you the similar subsequence patterns from the data. So by doing this, we actually avoid a, 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 an, I mean, not working solution to apply the clustering. We naturally use the available information about the time in, in the time series. But I just want to highlight, 
our alignment is not directly based on the timestamp. So just now I highlighted the example, the daily profile, but the period could be anything. For example, your period can be three hours. Then your actual timestamp is not exactly the same. You, you basically need to say you need to put the index on your sampling data. At, let's say the first sampling point of every period, this is my first cluster. The second sampling points of all the periods in my training data, this is the second cluster I will get. So is it clear? I hope it's clear. So this is a core part of the, our methods or autoencoder for us. Once you know this group, then the idea is very simple. For each of the group, now you train a single, uh, an individual autoencoder based on this uh, subgroup of the data only. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the actual training of the autoencoder. So we didn't spend a lot of effort on fine tune the architecture of the autoencoder. So instead, we fix the structure. Like autoencoder has two layers of encoder. Each one try to reduce the input dimension to half. And we have two layers of decoder. Each one try to increase the input dimension to two times. Right? So the activate function, we all use the ReRU. Uh, expect the last layer, we use the linear activation function. So um, the, the idea to use the standard, uh, standard structure and the standard training process, we use the early stop mechanism to stop the training if the benchmark performance is reached. Otherwise, we run the maximum number of the epoch before the training is complete. So what we want to try to achieve is like we want to use this standardized uh, architecture and training process to train on every single in individual autoencoder across different types of the IoT stream to avoid the, to reduce the cost, to avoid the unnecessary customization. That's how we want to achieve like lower down the cost of the solution, push the adoption for this. And actually, we found it works quite well across different types of the autoencoder. The reason I probably can explain is because now the training data for every single autoencoder is very focused. Because I only pass a subgroup, which you only have one or two, at least a lot more or less than the whole data set to the autoencoder. It really can focus on this pattern only. And this is the result I want to demonstrate. So previously, we show for the two uh, patterns, which are very different, single autoencoder actually can encode them quite well. But if you apply <coughs> the autoencoder forest to that, now you can see it can differentiate the two, profile, two profiles. For the normal profile, the autoencoder will encode it quite well. For the unusual profile, the autoencoder now cannot reconstruct the signal very well. right? But I want to highlight, actually, for the autoencoder forest, even though we have multiple models, in this case, the two windows actually is uh, encoded by the same autoencoder because they are aligned in the same time. So it's, it's not because the, I now I use the different encoder to encode it and they can differentiate. It's still using the same single autoencoder, but this time this encoder only trained with a specific pattern. It won't be confused by you, you give them a, a lot more pattern to learn. So, so this is the example I, I hope I can illustrate to the audience to make you understand what is the motivation and how we design it and what's the impact and e effect this solution apply when you apply on the real situation. So next, I want to talk a bit about the end-to-end -end workflow. So once you've had a solution, to really drive this solution, we need to automate it. We need to make it as a service. So this is the standard end-to-end -end workflow for training. Uh, the time series data will go through, we need to apply some time series, time series analysis and processing. After these two steps, the rolling window at every data point will be extracted as the training data. From there, we train the autoencoder forest, which basically a collection of the autoencoders. And this will complete the training phase. And for the anomaly detection flow, the new test data will be passed through similar processing and analysis will be applied on the test data. And the rolling window of every single point will be checked and will be sent to the autoencoder. A specific autoencoder will be picked up and score the, the sequence. And this is how you can get the anomaly score. And 
there are some very important analysis part we I want to highlight. First, it's about the periodic uh, pattern analysis because we need this period to determine every data point which cluster it belongs to. So the idea behind is we will compute the local maximum of the autocorrelation and we will get the mode of the interval between any two local maximum points. And you can see from this example, it's a, it's a time series data with uh, every five minutes sampling points. It shows the daily uh, patterns, even though there are, some, there are a lot of deviation. But in, even in this case, the proposed method still be able to detect correctly the daily pattern as the period. The, the another processing, important processing I want to highlight is about the missing data handling. So for the IoT time series, there are, speci there are specific uh, things about misalignment because you know the sensor send in the data due to the sensor issues and network issues. Sometimes the interval, even though it's fixed, but the real data sent in, it, there's a misalignment. So for example, uh, in, in the top example, the, the data actually supposed to come in at 4.30, but the data come in one minute late. This is what I call the misalignment. In this ca case, actually there's no data missing. You just need to align the data points. And in the second case, it's like if, if really there's a big gap about more than two times of the interval, you don't have the new data comes in. This is a situation you have a missing value. So to fill the, the missing value, we have a two strategy. If the gap is very small, we will use the nearby value to fill in the missing data. If the gap is very big, then we will use the same uh, period, uh, the, the medium value of the same sampling point from the other period to fill in the gap. And this is anomaly score. Again, we, we want to put the anomaly score very simple. So the idea is like we will get the the rolling window from the test data, but we don't want to score the whole windows. So in, in the first portion, we use the medium profile to fill in the, the window. And only the, the last key points are at actual value. And when this uh, data will pass into the land auto encoder forest, a specific auto encoder will be selected and use it to reconstruct the sickness. And finally, the Euclidean score was computed between the last key points to compute the reconstruction error. Yeah, so I, I will quickly go through a few examples to highlight uh, what is the performance and, and the benefit for these methods. So this is a time series data about a, a cool water return temperature from the cooling tower. So you can see this is a, this is a, a time series sampling every five minutes. And they are, the, it shows a strong daily pattern, but there's a lot of uh, uh, anomalies. Some anomalies is about the sensor issues. Some anomalies is about the miss uh, operation and some special events. From, from, the, from the left bottom figure, this is our anomaly score chart. So you can see uh, the, the solution actually successfully detect those very obvious uh, anomalies about the extreme values. It also detects some very subtle anomalies. For example, like this part is a, is a special event corresponding to this anomaly score. And also there's a flat line indicate the sensor fault, which is highlighted in here, right? So because our methods assign the real anomaly score for every single data point, so it allows the customers actually to progressively select different level of the, according to the severity, different level of anomaly to take action. So he can look at the, the top anomaly score first, and then he can go down to a more subtle anomaly score. Then the user actually can find to say what kind of level, what kind of a percentage I want to see in the future about the anomaly. This is another time, uh, the IoT time series about the uh, chill water return temperature from the chiller. And similarly, this is the time series about the 15 minutes sampling rate. And there's a strong uh, sampling irregularity. I mentioned misalignment in this time series. But as I introduced before, our, our solution can be able to handle this kind of irregularity quite well. And you can see it successfully detect the very obvious uh, anomaly here and also detect some kind of misalign, misoperation pattern. So you can see the, besides the top uh, anomaly, the rest of anomaly is about a single pattern. It's like in the morning, the, the chill water temperature will significant drop and then come back. This is something unusual compared to other days. 
The other days, the, the, when the temperature go up, and then you will immediately go to the normal range. But in these few anomalies, you can see the temperature always go up first, go down very significantly, and come back again. And the last uh, example I want to highlight, this is our smart meter data. So it's, uh, it's, it's for industrial environment. It's not in your household. But similar to a household, it's every half an hour uh, electricity consumption. So the, from the blue, blue graph, you can see this is the original sickness. Actually, for humans, it's not easy to identify what is normally there. But after our solution applied, you can see very clearly a few anomaly pop up with a very high anomaly score. And if you go into the detail about the how the autoencoder reconstruct the original signal, actually it provides some explanation why a point was uh, returned as a normally by the model. Because, for example, in this day, you can see the model actually expect there's no significant jump at the afternoon uh, 2.30 p.m. But the, the input signal, which is deviated from what model believe, has a huge uh, jump consumption around this time. So I think that it, it's beyond a, 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 just a black box. The autoencoder, the way how he can reconstruct the input signal, actually provides some information for the staff to understand why there's a normally, what kind of normally happen in this period of time. Okay. Uh, so this is what I want to share. That's all. Thank you.